Right boys, so in this video we're going to talk about this book. This is Pottinger's Cats. So I'm going to do a series of videos on diet and nutrition, so what food we should, we should be eating. And I've done various videos on dopamine, sleep, hydration, different basic fundamental things of health and you can check all those videos out. But And they sort of require one video each, so the breath uh, the breathing one, how to breathe correctly. I read three books, Wim Hof, The Oxygen Advantage and Breath and then comb combined the information and then made one video about it that could summarise it. With food, it's been quite elusive and quite hard to get my head around. So there are multiple books, so it will be like a series of food videos. But today we're talking about Pottinger's cats and what he found out in terms of nutrition. So this is actually quite a simple book. When I did the book on sleep, by I believe it was Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep, it was such a hard book to take points from. It's very scientific and just the way it was written, I find that some books, it's just point after point, do this, this and this, and it's all good. And this is gonna benefit you, sort of like actionable steps. But Why We Sleep, is kind of all over the place. He talks about REM sleep, then deep sleep, and then REM sleep again, and yeah, there's obviously a lot to understand. But this book by Francis M. Pottinger is a very simple book to understand. There's one concept, and the points are quite simple. So Pottinger's Cats is kind of like Pavlov's Dogs. So you've probably heard of Pavlov's Dogs, and he did experiments with dogs and conditioned them to associate a cue with a response, essentially. So he would ring a bell, give them food, and then they would associate the ringing of bell with food, and then he could get dogs to salivate just by ringing a bell. He didn't need to present them with food. Normally, if you present a dog with food, the dog will salivate in anticipation of eating the food, but he changed the cue from the food to ring in a bell. So you're probably familiar with that, you've probably heard of that at school. Pottinger did an experiment on cats where he fed different groups of cats different nutritious foods. So one group of cats would get raw foods, so raw milk, raw fish, things like that. And then another group would get cooked. So that's a form of processing. Cooking is a form of processing. So he had multiple groups and I'll just read you a like a description of basically what his experiment was, but that's basically it. He took multiple cats, had them in pens so they could kind of run around and fed them different diets and looked at what the outcome was. Pottinger's Cats is an experiment conducted by Francis Marion Pottinger Jr., a physician in the 1930s. Pottinger conducted research on the effects of heat processed food on cats' health. He observed that cats fed on a diet of raw unprocessed food remained healthy, while those fed cooked or processed food developed various health problems across generations, including dental issues, skeletal deformities and behavioural abnormalities. He even noticed that when the experiments were completed and the pens were empty, weeds would naturally grow through the ground. So they were kind of outside pens, which would be exposed to rainwater. So it's like watering the earth. And when you've got any bare ground, weeds just grow through. And the weeds grew dramatically larger in the pens where cats were fed raw milk in comparison to the pens where cats were fed pasteurised or evaporated milk. There are pictures in the book and they're very striking. He also planted beans in the empty pens as an experiment and the same was true. The pens that had the urine and faeces of raw milk cats and the beans grew noticeably larger, three times larger in many cases. So I'll show you the picture. So this one is raw milk and then that one is pasteurised milk. See how it's like a little jungle, the weeds are growing massive and then in the pasteurised there's basically nothing growing. And I found that quite interesting because he had one experiment which was the cats, how does processed or unprocessed food affect how these cats health develop. 
and then he had the second experiment just happen naturally. When he'd emptied the pens, the weeds either grew massive or they didn't, and that was depending on what the animals were, what the cats were eating. So this forms part of my philosophy on food, and this is why I talk about minimally processed raw, so some of the things I'll eat, like raw liver, raw bone marrow, fruit is obviously fresh, this is where it comes from. It comes from this and another book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price, came to the same conclusion and other books that I'll mention. So as we go through the food books, we're like building up. I found it was kind of like I was working my way through and piecing it together because there's a lot of opposing opinions when it comes to diet. You've got people that are advocates of the vegan diet, people that are advocates of the carnivore diet, and they often just have one-sided arguments, like this is the best thing to do. So I read a book on plants, read a book on animal products, read Pottinger's cat, so this is what we're doing, we're piecing it together. So now I'm just gonna run through the points that I learned from Pottinger's cat's experiment, and it is basically that, that raw food is better than processed food. So when I talk about my what I eat in a day on a minimally processed raw food diet or minimally processed diet, this is one of the pieces of information that has helped me gain that perspective. The study suggested that nutrition plays a significant role in overall health and highlighted the importance of consuming minimally processed foods for optimal well-being. So if you're following this channel, you probably resonate with that and that makes sense to you. Health is going to be impacted by nutrition. You want to get nutritionally dense foods and that's going to probably come from, just logically, without reading these books, foods that are as close to how nature provides as possible and that's raw. But obviously some foods like meat, common consensus is you can't eat those raw and people are experimenting all over the place now eating raw meat so maybe that's not correct, maybe you can eat raw meat. So with that, do your own research and use your own discretion to decide whether you want to do that. Poor nutrition creates degeneration in health. As long as you eat an optimal diet, your health improves. So they're the two things he found. Poor nutrition creates a degeneration in health of these cats, and if it's the same in humans, then humans. But any time he improved the diet that he was feeding the cats their health improved and so did the health of their offspring so you can he called them regenerative cats so it would be a cat would have a litter and then he would take some of those kittens and feed them healthy raw food and they would regenerate so all the time you implement to so say you're obese like i was or you have a chronic illness the takeaway point here is if you start improving your diet nutrition will have an impact on improving your health outcome. And then the next point. So I'm just gonna go through point by point. You are as healthy as the animals or plants you eat. So this is why you wanna eat grass-fed beef, pasture-raised eggs, wild-caught fish, organic, pesticide-free, hormone-free. So the health of the animal or the health of the plant you consume is determined by what they're eating and what they're exposed to. So that could be a plant or an animal plants you're going to want no pesticides and then for them to be organic animals you're going to want no hormones no drugs to keep them alive no uh, like battery hens that are all crammed together not getting sunlight they're going to be deficient in vitamin d whereas if you've got hens or chickens that are running around in the pasture their diet is going to be higher in protein because they're eating bugs out of the grass and they're exposed to sunlight so you are what you eat and you are as healthy as what you eat ate or what you eat was exposed to, whether that's plants or animals. So that was just a key factor. And this, some of these points, when I read these books and go through them, when you hear them from multiple sources, you know it's probably correct. So it's like a little treasure hunt and you piece together, you, your philosophy kind of builds as you go. And that's one that keeps coming up. That will come up in Michael Pollan's book, Food Rules and Paul Check's book, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy, in most of them, to be fair. So that is a key takeaway. So that's one to like put on the list of rules to keep. 
allergies and hypothyroidism result from deficient diets. So that's just a point he made in the book. I'm not saying whether that's correct or not, but that's what he observed. Live as nature intended, active life, real foods, raw foods. So diet and exercise. Degeneration due to diet is synonymous with a loss of sexual features, asexuality and infertility. So it is observable in society at the moment that the birth rate is going down. So this might correlate with current issues associated with birth rate. Next point he makes is breastfeed. Good facial structure due to suckling. So he is quite adamant about the point of breastfeeding. So if possible, if you're a pregnant mother, you're going to want to breastfeed. And this has come up in multiple books as well. And I heard that the amount of, there's some nutrient, I think it's iron, but the amount of iron in the milk that a breastfeeding mother produces, the percentage of iron concentration changes from like the first couple of months throughout the next couple of months. So it like goes from a certain percentage and changes massively in alignment with what the baby requires. So your body is so smart and formula milk isn't doing that. It's not changing. You probably get different milks for different stages, but your body knows intuitively what that baby requires. So multiple books in terms of food have all said, have emphasised the importance of breastfeeding. And it's important for the facial structure of the baby because this again was in another book. When you suck, it it uses certain muscles that form your facial structure. So you want to transition from breastfeeding to certain foods in the correct order. If you start skipping steps, this is where you get like chins back here and stuff like that. Cow quality matters for meat and dairy, hormone, drug-free, grass-fed, not corn, etc. So again, this is why I bang on about grass-fed beef from a local farm. This has come up in multiple books. You want grass-fed animals. Cooking food is bad, raw is best. That was the main takeaway from his experiment. Now, you can't always eat raw food, but that is going to be your best option where possible. To help a growing child build strong bones, feed them raw milk, raw meat, raw vegetables, fresh fruit. Again, this is just what he said in the book. Whether you should feed your child raw meat or not, it's entirely up to you. We are all influenced by preceding generations. Good food is essential for every phase of growth, but especially in pregnant women. So we are influenced by our parents' genetics and how healthy they were when we were conceived and um, developed during pregnancy in our mother. And that's why it's important at any stage to have a healthy diet, but especially in pregnancy. Successful human diets that Pottinger recommends are number one veg eggs milk meat and fish meat fish seafood and veg or just omnivore meat and veg this is a point that's come up over and over again in the research i've done and i was unaware of this i thought fat was bad but the the point here is fat as a macronutrient is good low fat and fat free are pointless so when you get a low fat yogurt or fat free dairy of any kind that's pointless fat as a macronutrient is very beneficial and that was like some scientific studies have falsely convinced people that fat is bad liver and cod liver oil is good i think that's common knowledge heat foods as little as possible get vitamins and minerals from foods naturally riching them from your diet not supplements and I've always liked the idea of this. The only thing I normally supplement is cod liver oil because it's come up in every book I've read and vitamin D because I live in the UK and it's not sunny enough. Apart from that, I just assume if I'm eating real foods, like nutrient dense, then I'll get the vitamins I need. Consume gelatin regularly. I need to do more research on gelatin to know what to talk about with that. Recommended foods. Liver, bacon, ground beef, fish, poultry, leafy greens daily, yellow veg once per day. And if you can count a carrot as a yellow veg, I know they do, you can get carrots different colours. 
but this lines up with what was in Dr. Lustig's book about, oh no, this was Dr. Batman Gadji's book about one carrot a day fulfilling some nutritional need. And like I said, I like simple rules like that. Limit starchy vegetables like potatoes to once per week. Frozen is better than tinned. Eat fresh fruits in season. So the fresh fruits, it will, fruit will, will signal to your body to store body fat because throughout history we've evolved and fruits wouldn't have been abundant all year round. They would have only been available in the summer. So when you eat that fruit, your body is triggered and it's saying store this because winter's going to come and you're going to need this energy. So it will store as fat quickly and it's high in sugar. And now you can eat a food, a fruit in the middle of winter that would never grow and you're going to store that as fat because your body's like, well, this is obviously summertime. We better store this for the winter. And this has come up in other books. Eat fresh fruits in season. So this helps you avoid the storing it, storing too much fat because if you just eat them in the summer, sunlight helps you burn body fat anyway. So it all kind of works out. Nature has figured this out that you get fruit in the summer and you get other things in the winter. So when you start eating fruit like mango in the dead of winter, which I do to be honest, but your body doesn't know what to do with it and you'll get excess body fat. Now, if you're in a calorie deficit, you can get around all of this. When eating fruit, fulfill your protein need first. Don't overeat fruits as they're high in sugar. Wash the fruit skins. Eat citrus fruits whole, not just the juice. This is in Dr. Lustig's book, Fat Chance. He says drinking orange juice is the most effective way of giving yourself diabetes and gaining weight. And I've got personal experience. I've got friends that drink loads and loads of orange juice. And that is kind of the effect that it's having for them. Serve raw pineapple occasionally. And I think this is because it's seasonal. I'm guessing pineapple isn't going to grow in the UK in winter. Do you know what I mean? It's just not. There are some fruits that aren't even going to grow in the UK at all. Even in summer. Because I've got an allotment and I grow flowers and some fruits. And... Even raspberries sometimes don't uh, ripen up fully because we don't have enough sun. So for me in the UK, I should be moderating what I eat anyway and not importing something that's just had a really hot summer. Like mango, I love mango. And I tried growing a mango tree and it doesn't really, our climate doesn't allow for it unless you've got it in a greenhouse or something. Cut down sugar consumption to a bare minimum. Again, this has been in every single book I've read. Sugar is poison. And you want to avoid it at all cost. Eliminate candies and sweets. And that's why. Because it's high in sugar. And then the last point was. Spongy or light coloured liver is bad. And I've got a story about this. I've always got my liver from my farm down the road. And it's always been lovely. It's been great. Very dark colour. And just fine. And then I couldn't get it from my farm. So I had to go to my local butcher and I don't really like my local butcher. The guy's rude and it just seems like you're an inconvenience. Every time you go in, you ask for something and it's like he doesn't want to sell it to you. And I think, mate, you run a shop. So what are you on about? But I asked him for some liver and he pulled this liver. It seemed like it was out the bottom. It wasn't like the fridge that all the other nice meats were in. He just kind of pulled it along the floor, it looked like, essentially. So he pulled out some floor liver for me didn't seem like he wanted to sell it to me and it was all like white and spongy and it was exactly as this author describes and because I can't get it from my farmer she has trouble with her butcher so I can't always get it I thought oh yeah I'll buy all of it I bought this massive lump of liver and I just binned it I had one bit of it binned it and that was before I read this book and I thought that liver's dodgy and it was spongy and light coloured. And then when I read it in this book, I was like, oh, that's something to remember. Because now when I'm buying liver, you want the darkest colour possible. So yeah, that's just a final point. But yeah, so it's quite a straightforward book. I've just sort of give you the points. And the main moral of the story is eat real foods, minimally processed. Even cooking is a form of processing. If you can handle raw foods, that's obviously going to be best. And if you've got health conditions, 
improving your diet is going to help improve that. I mean, this is obvious and it forms basically the basis of my food philosophy. Sugar, avoiding sugar and some of the pitfalls of fruit. So I'll continue to update you on what I'm eating. I'm doing a bit of an experiment at the moment with normal foods, what I call normal people foods, which isn't like this. So I might sound, I might look like a little bit of a hypocrite over the next few days on my community post because I upload pictures of what I'm eating, but that's why. I'm just experimenting. It's only nine days till the end of February, but I'll continue to tell you. So I'll do more book reviews and it'll be like a series. So yeah, hope that helps. See you tomorrow.